Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Miranda Janelle, Justin Zellers, and Pepper Giese. Coming up on DTNS, SoundCloud bets on algorithms to help you find better music. Vehicle data could make us all safer. And do we focus too much on bias in AI? This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, May the 4th be with you, 2022. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We are going to talk about a hot button issue. It's not Twitter. Actually, we will talk about Twitter. But we're going to talk about bias in AI. But first, a few tech things you should know. Samsung's memory manufacturing is arguably more successful than its phones. The company just announced Universal Flash Storage 4.0, which can achieve 30, I'm sorry, 23.2 gigabits per second per lane. 30 would be better, but 23 is still pretty good, <laughs> which is double what UFS 3.1 could do. This helps memory keep up with increasing throughput that comes from faster internet service like 5G. It's also 46% more power efficient than 3.1, so you get faster storage and also better battery life. And the one terabyte UFS 4.0 module is a hair smaller than the 512 gigabyte UFS 3.1 module. So you might say, sounds great, when do I get it? Samsung will begin mass production in Q3 of this year, meaning it could start showing up in phones by the end of the year and certainly in early 2023. The company also introduced Pro Endurance micro SD cards aimed at dash cams that can record continuously for 16 years. <laughs> the previous max was five years without stopping, so quite a jump. No kidding. Uh, here's, here's my 16 years of dash cam footage. Please review it. <laughs> uh, let's clear out all the Elon Musk buying Twitter stories right now. Uh, this shouldn't take long, so do, you don't even have to skip ahead too far if you're trying to avoid it. The chair of the UK Parliament's Digital Culture, Media and Sport Committee, Julian Knight, has invited Musk to testify about his plans for Twitter. Guessing he won't go, but he got invited. Musk has been talking to private investors who might go in on the deal with him, including existing shareholders that might be able to maintain their stake. He also says that he might take Twitter public again three years after he takes it private, uh, which he plans to do on the close of the deal. It's, a lot of companies have done that. Dell has done that. And he suggested he might charge for government and commercial use. There you go. That's it. That's the tweet. AMD, <laughs> plans the tweet for, news. <laughs> AMD plans to release a new gaming laptop CPU line codenamed Dragon Range, designed for high power machines with a 55 watt TDP and up. There are 20 millimeter thick laptops that probably need to be plugged in most of the time. It's also AMD's shot at capturing the top of the laptop gaming market, arguably already dominating the mid-range and below. AMD also announced a lower power Phoenix line of chips for thinner machines at 35 to 45 watts of power. Both will be part of the Ryzen 7000 series based on the Zen 4 architecture and will arrive in 2023. AMD will give more details on them before then, so the company says. In fact, AMD said that next quarter, it will start reporting gaming as its own financial segment. So expect more details on all of this at the June Analyst Day. All right. Uh, we have continually covered the U.S. dispute between mobile carriers and the Federal Aviation Administration and airlines over the deployment of C-band 5G wireless. We have a whole episode of Know a Little More about it if you want to dig in. The short version is that while C-band wireless does not operate in the same bandwidth as airplane altimeters, which are very important for landing safely, especially in fog, some older altimeters don't properly filter out all the C-band transmission. And the fight has been over whose responsibility that is. Should they replace their old altimeters or should the carriers modify how they broadcast around airports? Right now, carriers are biting by restrictions near airports, but that goes away July 2022. Reuters reports that the FAA is meeting Wednesday with telecom and airline officials to push to retrofit and eventually replace altimeters that might face interference from C-band 5G. The U.S. nonprofit National Bureau of Economic Research studied usage of Chivo, that's El Salvador's national Bitcoin wallet. Since it launched last September, around half of Salvadorans have downloaded the wallet, which came with a $30 incentive, you know, just get you started. Of those who downloaded it, though, 61% have stopped using it. 
Remaining users tend to be unbanked people who use it to hold and transfer dollars. Yeah, so maybe not the glowing success some people would have liked, but there you go. That's the update. All right, uh, I got to, we got some car news, Scott. Well, uh, I had an experience last week where I got to get an up close and personal experience with a uh, with a Rivian truck mm. in, the, in the famous Gear Tunnel. And uh, one of the things I learned about it that I didn't know is how much data this thing collects. It's always taking pictures, always taking video, always recording uh, data. So these, we know this is already happening. They're out on the road. They're collecting data, maybe more than ever before. And now we have a brand new effort. What is it? Yeah, GM. GM is partnering with a company called Inrix to collect data from vehicles for U.S. transportation officials to analyze. The data would be formatted for the Transportation Department's Safe Streets and Roads for All program. Uh, and would include pedestrian and construction worker data. So it's trying to prevent pedestrian and construction worker deaths. It could also be used by local governments for road safety projects and also for Vision Zero, uh, an effort to reduce fatalities and serious injuries on the road. I don't, this doesn't feel like it's the first time I've heard of this, though. It's no, not like definitely the first not. effort of its kind. No, there's a bunch of these. Honda Research Institute USA announced a pilot program in December that would use data from cameras and GPS in its cars to help monitor road conditions and identify repairs for local transportation departments. That pilot program is taking place in Ohio. Uh, in December 2020, Europe's Data for Road Safety Initiative announced a long-term deployment of a safety-related traffic information system that would integrate data from cars and traffic systems to create warnings for drivers of dangerous conditions. Uh, and the International Transport Forum runs the International Road Traffic and Accident Database, ERTAD, I-R-T-A-D, uh, that contains a validated crash and exposure data from 32 countries, including the United States, going back to 1970. Uh, and it makes that data available for safety agencies to use as well. I mean, I, f I feel like a lot of people will go, well, okay, we all want uh, construction workers and anybody who might be crossing the road when, when cars are going by to be as safe as possible. But if if you're collecting the data of how I was uh, exceeding the speed limit, you know, for the last three days, is it going to come back to me in some way? I think that I think that's 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 where some of this like, hmm, what are we really doing with this data comes in? Yeah, to me, I I don't know why. This is probably not a fair comparison, but it feels like browser data going back some years where the big concern was, well, with this new ad advent of cookies back when that was a new thing and these ideas that you can kind of be tracked across the site you're on as well as when you left, where did you go and this sort of thing made a lot of people go, well, I don't want to be followed around. I don't want people to know everywhere that I'm going, whether or not you're up to something skeevy or weird or whatever, it doesn't matter. I just don't want people following me, especially, you know, government or big companies or whatever. And I feel like this is a little like that I don't want to call it fear, but whatever that feeling of like easy now, don't, you know, don't give every little piece of data away because some people maybe don't want someone else to know that they, I don't know, they take a certain road on their commute or whatever the reasons may be. Um, sure. I can't help but yeah. feel the parallels from that, from that conversation for some reason. Yeah. And, and that's why it's important to, this is a great example of data collection does not immediately mean privacy violation. And in mm -hmm. fact, data collection doesn't immediately mean ad targeting, which, which we all kind of jump to the conclusion. Sometimes it's not about surveillance. It's about safety. safety. And th this, yeah. this is important data to have to literally save people's lives, uh, especially construction workers. I, I, people just kind of forget uh, how much risk those construction workers are at when they're out doing highway work. So it's important, you guys are absolutely right, it's important that this data be privacy first. Most of these efforts have good privacy policies in place and all of them at least say, and I haven't looked to see if they're audited, but they say that they are only aggregating data incidents. They're not tying it to like a license plate number or even a VIN or anything like that. They're just saying like this, you know, these amount of cars passed this place at this speed, uh, that, that sort of stuff there. Yeah. There'll always be some percentage of people who just say, well, I don't, I don't believe them when they tell me that. And sure. that's fine. Yeah, Whatever. Yeah. There's always going to be that. But personally, uh, I think data is important in almost every aspect of uh, life these days. And I think this kind of data would go a long way to not just help us ease into the, uh, you know, more energy efficient electric car era that we're slowly entering into, uh, or automation. I mean, these things are going to benefit from that data, of course, but just good old fashioned, how's that stretch of the highway performing data yeah, right. is really interesting. I, and not only interesting, but saves lives, saves money, saves a lot of headaches. So why I not? want my car to tell a, a database that will use that knowledge 
that this road needs work and <laughs> this road is full of dangerous potholes the, the you know this yeah. bridge is crumbling like yeah I, I i let me opt in i guess but but do that and and integrate it more let's use organizations like ertod uh, to compile this and make it available to everybody who can use it. Uh, transportation agencies, car companies, road repair, etc. Music streaming services are a convenient way to listen to music you want to listen to. Uh, I think we all agree on that. But sometimes it's really difficult to find good new stuff. That's always the trick. How good is the recommendation? Sounds like SoundCloud's got an idea, Sarah. Indeed. Yeah. So I, I'm one of those people who I, I tend to kind of listen to the same stuff over and over because discovery can be overwhelming to me. And I, I don't always get what I want if I'm just kind of trying new music, um, unless it was specifically recommended by a friend, etc. SoundCloud has acquired a company called Musio. That's M-U-S-I-I-O. It's an audio AI company that can listen to new music and identify what makes a hit a hit. SoundCloud says it wants to use Musio to sort through its library of largely amateur music. Not everything on SoundCloud is amateur music, but there's a lot of it. And also help people discover things that they might love but might not find on their own. Because Musio's tools can sift through hours of music, countless hours in fact, and then pick up the songs that have certain patterns and characteristics that correlate with being popular. This is a bit of a, a, bit of a math project really. Yeah, yeah. And they're not the only ones doing it, right? Who else is out there doing this? Yeah. So music uh, distribution platform uh, TuneCore announced uh, back in February that it's partnering with LA-based music startup Fuego. That's F-W-A-Y-G-O. Uh, Get Harvard. it? Yeah. Fuego. <laughs> nice. uh, it also uses AI to match listeners with creators. So it's a little bit different, but uh, the idea is to get a creator to be able to uh, have a deeper connection with somebody who really likes their music that would not have found them otherwise. TuneCore is a division of global dig digital music company called Believe. It's based in Paris, France. Fuego is a mobile music discovery platform which helps independent artists increase their exposure, also their earnings potentially, and they launched in beta last year. Along the same lines, DIY music distributor DistroKid, it's been around for some time now, has an AI bot already in place. <laughs> that bot is named Dave, and it reviews tracks mm. and ranks qualities like danceability, uh, speechiness. Now, you might say, well, okay, what, what, what does all that mean? Results, at least, you know, as far as I checked it out, a little varied. So, for example... Um, Dave's review of the song If You Want to Build a Legacy, You're Gonna Have to Break Some Legs. Uh, that is by an artist called Madison Minor. I included 3% speechiness, meaning the song probably doesn't have talking. I listened to the song, it's like a heavy metal song, so there was a lot of yelling, screaming. Mm. Uh, you might say, Oh, Okay, that's not rapping, you know. <laughs> you know, some maybe there's some nuances there, but um, but yeah, it, it uh, it, the DistroKid uh invites uh people who have submitted music on its platform already to submit to Dave and you know see where people uh where, where people fall in the percentages of what is this music how how good how good is it to me based on what I want to listen to right now. Yeah. yeah, I the one takeaway I have from from just the 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 recent years of of streaming music, wherever the source is, uh, that they all do okay with their algorithms and that approach. Um, Spotify, Apple Music, and others seem to do okay in that regard. Um, but I'm a little surprised this announcement or this, uh, let's say, these movements are happening in the smaller what we would consider the smaller areas of music recommendation on the internet. It isn't Spotify announcing a big AI initiative to improve their searchability or findability. It's not Apple announcing it either. It's a, uh, it's coming from smaller places. I wonder if we'll see the big boys adopt similar, a similar well, plan, something do. with AI. They just don't make as big of a deal about it. Right. Mm -hmm. SoundCloud had to acquire a company. Spotify and, and Apple have, have both bought AI companies in the past. I think we're just less surprised and we don't talk about those as much because we expect those companies to buy AI. And we already know Spotify uses algorithms uh, to recommend stuff. I think, sure. I think what's, what's distinctive about this is SoundCloud is saying not just 
discovery. Uh, Jerdstar in our chat said, I don't think math solves music discovery well. It's a subjective issue. We don't just want more of the same. But that's not what SoundCloud's doing. They are looking through and saying, there's a lot of bad music here. Sorry, guys, but there is. We can make we can narrow it down for you and say these are most like the kinds of music that succeed and then still leave it up to you to subjectively decide which ones you like. And that's a little different than Spotify, which is trying to say, oh, well, we know you like this. Let me give you more like that. Yeah. Also, this is, you know, just to be clear for all of us here. Yes, this can be helpful for discovery, but this is also really helpful for uh, artists who already have a presence, who are trying to figure out, oh, who's the next person to collab with or a manager. Oh, yeah, there, yeah, there's totally. a lot of business, uh, you know, senses of this that make a lot of sense because SoundCloud is a place where I, I, I mean, you know, many artists have kind of made a name for themselves. But there are a lot of artists who obviously are trying to make a name for themselves who can't. And it's not because they're not talented. It's because there's just a lot of junk in there. Yeah, you're and, back to the discoverability problem. Uh, yeah. And it happens with every medium. Podcasting's this way, uh, certainly music. Um, it's getting, I think, to the point where streaming services have enough original content that they're struggling with discoverability of their newer shows if they're not you know, marketing them right or whatever. Uh, so, you know can we get the next weekend or the next post Malone or the next whoever to spring out of uh, SoundCloud the way they have in the past? Probably, but they were also among a fewer base. Then they had some advantages in that regard. And now those, those places are full of really talented people. How do they get noticed? I think this is the track. This is the way you go. Yeah. It's, it's like a diagnostic assistant, right? The doctor still dis determines whether you have the disease or not, <laughs> but the AI can help narrow it down where to look, yep. right? And give an advice of like, yep, might be that. Uh, and the doctor signs off. SoundCloud is right now having to just kind of luck into finding things. It, I'm sure people at SoundCloud go through tons of bad songs. They're like, nope, nope, nope. Before they finally <laughs> hit one, like, oh, that one's pretty good. We can recommend that on the homepage. So this is going to make that job easier, narrow it down. So they're only listening to the likely candidates, which would theoretically make their homepage recommendations and their other recommendations better because they can now choose a wider variety because they have more to choose from. Whereas yeah. before they wasted a lot of time listening to things they were never going to highlight. It would be cool if they broke some real ground here so that we could see some of these ideas bleed into other mediums. I think podcasting in, in particular is really hard to get noticed if you're new. But even mm -hmm. old timers like us, we do a new show. A lot of times we're counting on our current base to know about it and to spread the word. Very hard to get noticed for new people. So yeah. these kinds of initiatives I think are, are going to be really important for user created stuff moving forward. Well, we have a little more to talk about on the ethics of using these kind of algorithms in a second. But first, uh, I want your ideas. If you have ideas about hosts and guests from other podcasts and shows that we should have on this show, let us know. Check out our guest survey and put in your recommendations at dailytechnewsshow.com slash survey. Well, in 2021, there were more than 400,000 research papers published on subjects relating to artificial intelligence, and that number continues to rise. As the work expands, so do the concerns around it. Ethics and bias in the field have led to multiple controversies at Google, for example, and certainly elsewhere, where among the outlets who have emphasized the importance of accounting for human bias in training data. It happens. How do I identify it? And how do we make it better? Protocol has an interview out today called Stop Worrying About AI Bias All the Time. <laughs> what is going on with that? <laughs> yeah, no, isn't that crazy? It's like, we're, like you said, we're always saying, like, got to be careful of bias. Here's a person saying, don't worry about it. Uh, it's not exactly what she's saying, though. It's an interview with Bina Amanath, executive director of the Global Deloitte AI Institute and head of Trustworthy AI and Ethical Tech. You should read it. It's an excellent read over a protocol, doing great work. Uh, Amanath knows what she's talking about. She's a database and SQL developer. She's worked in data science and AI for more than 10 years at Bank of America, GE, Hewlett Packard, and then joined Deloitte in 2019 and just wrote a book called Trustworthy AI. In that book, she writes the following. What passes for public scrutiny is too often just seductive clickbait headlines that fret over AI bias and point to a discrete use case. 
There's a lot of noise on AI ethics and trust, and it does not move us closer to clarity or consensus on how we keep trust in AI commensurate with its power. All right. So if you're someone who says, well, shouldn't we be concerned about AI bias? What, 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 what direction is she going in? Yeah, yeah. No, she's pointing out that it, it's not that there isn't bias or that we shouldn't be concerned about it. It's that we only think of bias in the cases where it matters. And there are lots of cases out there where other ethical concerns are important and those are getting overlooked. Uh, for example, she points out predicting jet engine failure or wind turbine power generation. Reliability, security, and safety are more important in those cases. She even uses a uh, medical example, uh, practicing, you could say like, oh, well, the medicine, it should always be about bias. Well, whether an MRI machine might fail or not, bias might play a part, but it's probably not the most important part. Uh, if human data isn't involved in a decision, bias probably doesn't play an important part. AI ethics also need to account for situations where other concerns might outweigh bias concerns, even when bias is a big concern. And she uses the example of identifying potential human trafficking victims as a place where there might be bias in your data set, but that bias might be tolerable if that algorithm is better at identifying victims of human trafficking over not using it. Uh, it's a question anyway. And I think, I think what she's trying to say is not don't take account of bias, but don't assume that's the only problem. Mm, so she, yeah. So she's not saying that bias is a problem, just that bias needs to be, uh, you need to identify it. And in certain situations it's helpful and in others it is not. Yeah. Yeah. She wants the public conversation to not identify bias as the only problem. Uh, we need to add to the conversation. So she recommends that ethical practices should be part of every employee's training. If, they, if you're using AI in your business, the intern should know about it just as much as the data scientist yeah. because every employee is going to use the tools that the data scientists create. The intern's gonna, in, in HR, is gonna use that weed out algorithm that the data scientists created for HR. So they need to know what questions to ask and everything like that. So it strikes me that the concern here might be, uh, this is my average brain speaking here, so I'm happy to be corrected on this, but it seems like um, the, the, the bias in AI is something that, let's say, lay folks, people who don't understand this stuff or haven't really paid a huge attention to it, they're going to be the ones with the least amount of information about what this even means. Like, what does mm -hmm. it even mean to say an AI has bias? I feel like there's a big opportunity for education um, kind of across the board. Totally. And that's what she's doing. This is good, right? This is a step in that direction, certainly. But so that people understand the more and more our world gets wrapped up in automated systems and AI driven systems that we have a, as, as clear an understanding as possible about what that actually means so that we can back off of the nerves about it a little bit. That seems like that's always kind of part of this problem. This is such advanced stuff, whether we're talking about vehicle automation or uh, a million other mm -hmm. tech advancements, um, you know, having a voice assistant in every room, this sort of thing. These scare people who don't, who haven't really been filled in. And so some of that is on them because they're just not bothering to fill themselves in. But this one feels like a complicated one. And I, and I hope, I hope there's more of this, more, more talking about it and less saying, well, it's AI. No one can understand, you know, this is really high end stuff. And then everyone feels like, well, wait a minute, you can't do that. I need to know. Yeah. I mean, it's built by humans. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's and, not that hard to understand. Right. <laughs> I agree. There's, there's a there's a nuance to to what she's saying which is, which I think gets lost in, in our our simplified, you know, 280 character conversations out there, which is uh you know, there's bias in AI. Well, then we should stop using it, right? Yeah. If 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 that's right, the extent right. of the conversation, you're going to come to the wrong conclusion because as she said, we can use these algorithms to predict jet engine failure. We can use them to stop human traffic. We use them for a lot of very good things. We just need to be responsible about how we use them. And that doesn't mean, oh, just ignore the bias. It means fix the bias and also make sure that you're paying attention to all of the ethical concerns and the other things you do uh, right. as well. And I think that's worth paying attention to. Yeah, it's not, it's not the same as saying, uh, we can't have uranium-based decorations at this restaurant. Um, no, we're going to go back and figure out how we can do it. This isn't that. This is yeah, an alterable, right. tweakable 
look at it from a different perspective, find something to go, oh, that is kind of weird. And we don't want that bias in there and go and tweak it again. Like I got to have that attitude, I think, for this. You have a lot of, yeah, a lot of places with uranium based decorations. For you. <laughs> no, I don't know why I thought of that. Yeah, it's like in, in what world? You know, a, 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 an example we can all identify with. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you're really a fan of uranium and you're like, yeah. man, I really Tom, want have to you not had a uranium party lately? Yeah, They're I, really I, fun. I just run in the wrong circles, I guess. Yeah, apparently so. Uh, Hey, wait, you're in my circles. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> Twitter circle. I know. Uh, yeah. Google Plus. Pour yeah. out a little liquor. Okay. Yeah. So US-based movie studios and streaming services, uh, this is not funny, have largely shut down in Russia and are no longer supplying their content to the country. And that's in protest over the war in Ukraine. We all know this. However, many folks in Russia were still able to go see the Batman and it wasn't because Warner Brothers or DC changed a policy or because theaters there broke the law. So what's going on here? Dan Campos has an explainer. Hello, DTNS crew. Movie theaters in Russia continue to release films like The Batman, Don't Look Up or Turning Red thanks to the use of torrents. While the blockades by Hollywood studios or the streaming services continues, organizations such as the Association of Cinema Owners in Russia issued a statement to indicate that the block threatened to crash their industry. At the end of March, Russia approved an act known as the Priority Action Plan to ensure the development of the Russian economy in conditions of pressure from external sanctions where it eliminates fines for violating copyright laws in digital assets such as movies, music, software, or video games. For more information about this, listen every day to Noticias de Tecnología Express, the Duolingo of tech podcasts. Ah, the, the, I love the Duolingo uh, of tech podcasts. Go go sign up for NTX <laughs> and brush up on your Spanish. Or if you already speak Spanish, it's going to be perfect for you. Uh, I had heard about this law uh, but I'm glad Dan brought this back to our attention to be like, yeah, they are in fact using it. It's not just a law they put on the books. Uh, they are showing the Batman uh, in theaters. To, to And and yeah, it's it's crazy to think that they went to the extent to to change copyright law because copyright yeah. law feels like that immutable thing that 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 even the the theater owners might be like well don't change it because if you you open that door then then piracy is going to get worse uh, i that's a weird and crazy thing to think about yeah and some people you just need the batman i get it man you got to have the batman so i'm not mm. saying this is good i'm not saying anybody is anything i'm just saying the batman <laughs> sometimes you need him <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, great responsibility. I don't know. Yeah, it's yeah. a it's an illegal bat signal, He's but it's not the, bat the signal. movie they deserve. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> God. But here's the movie they pirated. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. Mattia wrote in. This was uh, in response to our conversation Monday um, where, where uh, Rich uh, declared his love for Jens Lickman. Uh, Matias says, Jens Lechman will never go stale. Great deep dive into the music scene and why artists are increasingly releasing older products. Of course, the labels have been doing this for years with greatest hits compilations. But the cynic in me wants to point out remixes or modified versions of their original song is a cheap way to put out a new product and increase your revenue. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, the only correct response to this conversation is Hans shot first. Oh, very nice. Uh, the real quick note on that, um, it's not that different than, you know, what we used to call reruns back in the 80s. And uh, I'm watching The Fall Guy for some reason. Well, Don't, no, it's oh. different from reruns. It's like if they went and reshot the entire <laughs> show a, and yes, reread it. That's a better yeah, way of looking at it. Rerun is just a rerun. Yeah. And I wouldn't mind that. I'm not saying that The Fall Guy is totally out of date, but it's pretty out of date. So up your game. Isn't that what we that. get, though? Everything gets reimagined? <laughs> yeah. See, uh, you know that thing's uh, going to come. More than ever. Yeah. yeah. Things There's, are being reimagined quite often, in fact. Yeah. Mm. Who knows how many shelved more. scripts there are they for the Fall be. Guy movie? I know they exist. They there. Also, they're there. I, you guarantee they're there. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know the last time uh, anyone watched Back to the Future, but that's one of my favorite scenes where the kid's like, "What's a rerun?" <laughs> <laughs> and oh, he's no. like, "Oh, yeah. never mind." <laughs> yep. And they're, they're back to that because it's not a rerun to watch for for a lot of kids to watch Friends or The Office. It's the first time through. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. 
Great. Well, thanks to you, Scott Johnson, for being the best person ever. Uh, let folks know where they can keep up with everything else that you do. Yeah, take that every other day's guests. You guys are the worst. Just kidding. You guys are all great. Um, yeah, there's a lot going on. Uh, if you listen to the show, there's a good chance you like daily content, um, I have to figure. And so as a result, I thought today I would just mention that I have a daily morning show that I do with my good friend Brian Ibbett. In fact, Tom's on Wednesdays where he does a tech segment before we all come together here today uh, for this. And uh, that happens every week. So if you are looking for some good old-fashioned, fun morning entertainment that doesn't sound like every morning show you've ever heard, come check it out. We're over at frogpants.com slash TMS. It's the morning stream if you're searching for it for your uh, for your podcast apps or whatever. So again, that is frogpants.com slash TMS. And for everything else, you can find me on Twitter at Scott Johnson. Excellent. We also want to thank our brand new bosses, Christopher and George. Just started backing us on Patreon. Give a warm welcome to Christopher and George. <laughs> <laughs> it's very warm. It's That's very warm. warm. Yeah. There's, I don't know warm what you're... No, I didn't hit the wrong button. This is an actual <laughs> audience that we have here, and they blew the air <laughs> horn. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a longer version of the show <laughs> called Good Day Internet. Well, we'll probably laugh about this and lots of other things. Available at patreon.com slash DTNS for all the live viewers and those after rolls right after DTNS. But just a reminder, we're live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC on DTNS. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We are back doing it all again tomorrow because that's what we do on weekdays. Justin Marbury Young will be joining us. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this broker. <laughs>